Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Joel Gogler, and welcome. Uh, I'm Professor and Robert L. Kane, Endowed Chair in Long-Term Care and Aging in the School of Public Health here at the university, where I also direct our Center for, Center for Healthy Aging and Innovation. Um, welcome again to the second session of Mini Medical School, Aging and Health. We're excited to have you here today, and we look forward to guiding you through our second topic in the series, Creating Pathways to Healthy Aging. We hope we, you were here last week to hear our introduction, introduction to aging and health. If you weren't able to join us, we encourage you to watch the recording after this session. We're going to begin today with a moderated discussion followed by a question and answer session. You can submit your questions to our panelists at any time using the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please note that the session is being recorded and will be available starting tomorrow on the Office of Academic Clinical Affairs YouTube channel. We'll share the link to the recording with you by email. Really briefly, before we get started with our excellent panel today, I wanted to share with you some information about the Center for Healthy Aging and Innovation. I'm proud to say that all of our panelists here today are also members of our Center for Healthy Aging and Innovation. It's a center here at the University of Minnesota, which has the vision of a community, state, tribal nation, country, and world where every individual can achieve their life goals while aging. We have close to 160 members in the center across many, many units and centers and departments across the university. We also are very much an outward engaging center, an outward facing center, meaning that we also include 98 community partners who represent 64 different organizations. And also we have over 60 students that are involved in our center through our Aging Studies Interdisciplinary Group. I heartily encourage you, if you want to learn more, to visit our website, sph.umn.edu backslash chai, as you can see here. You are free to follow us on Twitter at UMN Chai, and certainly email us anytime at chai at umn.edu if you have any questions. If you'd like to learn more about the center, we're always happy to share that information with you and to welcome you into what we believe is a very vibrant community of people interested in aging science, aging education, and uh, the practice of, of aging. So last week we discussed a local to global look at aging, and today we have the privilege of speaking with a panel of experts on the latest research in aging, healthcare, and workforce challenges, as well as how the university is leading innovation in aging. And to introduce our panelists, I, I would like to first bring in uh, Laura Niedernhofer. Dr. Niedernhofer is a professor in the medical school and director of the Institute on the Biology of Aging and Metabolism and medical discovery team on the biology of aging. Dr. Niedernhofer's expertise is in DNA damage and repair, genome instability disorders, cellular senescence and, and cellular senescence and aging. Her research program is centered on studying fundamental mechanisms of aging and developing therapeutics to target them. Dr. Niedernhofer, can you explain what senescent cells are and how they're connected to healthy aging? My pleasure. So let me just pull up some slides here, please. Everything look okay? Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Gogler, for this opportunity, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. I'm really excited to share some really new research with you. Um, so let me start, though, with a 30,000-foot view of why senescent cells are so important to study. And it starts with this term, geroscience, which refers to a brand new approach to create healthier aging. So let me start, though, by offering you my disclosure. These are the sources of funding that I have for my research. They include very generous support from the state of Minnesota and the university's foundation. I do not receive any personal financial benefit from any of my research activities. I haven't learned how to make money out of this yet. <laughs> um, so let me give you the bigger picture. Geroscience is an attempt to address the fact that we are in a period of human history when the number of individuals over the age of 65 is doubling in the state of Minnesota. And this is not just a local or a first world problem. This is happening globally. In fact, in our nation, by the time we reach 2034, we are gonna have more older adults in our country than we do have individuals that are 18 or under. And this is gonna, have incredible impacts on virtually every aspect of our society, most particularly the healthcare industry. So what led to this shift in demographics? 
The answer actually is amazing biomedical research as illustrated in this slide. So the black line represents the ages at which individuals died in 1900. You see lots of infant mortality here to the left, childhood mortality, and even middle-aged mortality. But now if you reflect on the blue line, this is 2016, and we've squashed a lot of that. That's because incredible breakthroughs in treatments for infectious disease, cancer, and heart disease. So the net result though, is you can count on living into your 70s, 80s, and beyond, but some of these individuals are gonna spend up to four decades of their life in what's called the red zone, which is a period of increasingly, um, increased accumulation of chronic diseases or diseases worsening. So in other words, unhealthy aging for many people. In fact, we know that starting about the fifth or sixth decade of life, the incidence of most debilitating chronic diseases rises exponentially. So these are very familiar diseases that interfere with quality of life, mobility, and also include frailty and geriatric syndromes. So frighteningly, if you look at this top red horizontal line, over 50% of individuals 65 and over are gonna have two or more of these chronic diseases while 25% will have three or more chronic diseases. So this has led to the projection that either curing heart disease or curing cancer to the green and red lines compared to baseline will not impact the number of individuals who are truly healthy in old age. So the blue line is where we are today and we're showing the number of individuals as we go into the future who are healthy beyond 65. Again, these are curing cancer or curing heart disease, really don't shift the slope of that curve at all. Um, curing cancer is great, but not necessarily if those individuals have Alzheimer's disease, there's still an impact on quality of life. Now, instead, if we could somehow delay or slow aging, which is ambitious, it is predicted to be highly impactful on the num uh, on healthy aging. So this is what fostered the geroscience hypothesis. And that is that it would be more impactful to find a way to therapeutically target aging biology itself rather than to cure individual age-related diseases. And the thought this is that this geroscience approach would allow you to prevent delay or ameliorate multiple chronic diseases associated with old age with one intervention. You would also avoid spending then the rest of your life with your neurologist, oncologist, all your different doctors, this helps you prevent polypharmacy or having drugs from different um, caregivers that potentially interact. And this is actually a major cause of death in the elderly. And of course, it would have a huge impact on reducing healthcare costs. Another really compelling argument for the geroscience hypothesis is this graph is showing you that simply being older is at least a thousand times more potent as a risk factor for heart disease compared to the other very well-known risk factors that we are currently treating. So could we develop a drug here that would be more impactful than an antihypertension or a, a drug that lowers cholesterol? And in fact, if I showed you graphs for uh, Alzheimer's disease or cancer, it's always old age that is the greatest risk factor for these age-related diseases by orders of magnitude. So the goal of geroscience is to extend your health into older ages. Ideally, slowing this, or instead of slow, this slow decline here, this slope here, that shows your decline in fitness over time, we want to square the curve. So you stay very, very fit, and then you just drop dead. And um, it, this is really meant to extend your health span and not your lifespan. But there is a possibility there would be a slight extension of lifespan as a side effect of the geroscience hypothesis. So this has led into the, in the field to the question of what is aging biology and what should we be therapeutically targeting? And this is the, the consensus of the field that there's many hallmarks of aging. And these are things that just generally happen to a cell or an organism over time. So we have the primary drivers of aging here in blue, and this consists of damage to various molecules in your cell, whether it's DNA or protein. 
Then there's the response to those damages, like cellular senescence. And then there's hallmarks that sort of integrate all of this at a point where you've reached so much damage or so much uh, damage response that you can no longer rebalance your tissue and organ homeostasis. So we focus on cellular senescence that Dr. Gogler brought up for two reasons. And the first is there is irrefutable proof that in fact, senescent cells don't just happen with aging, they actually drive the aging process. And this is both genetic and pharmacologic proof. We also know that senescent cells by this point, we know them to be very druggable. So that's what we're doing in our institute. We're developing drugs that will eliminate senescent cells from your body. So what are they and why are they such bad actors? What happens in cellular senescence is it's a signaling cascade that occurs in response to a variety of extracellular or intercellular stressors. The cell will assume a stable state of cell cycle arrest. So they upregulate these proteins that will stop that cell from ever dividing and making a daughter cell again. So this is one of the most potent tumor suppressor mechanisms that we have, and it's critical for preventing cancer. But senescent cells have a number of other features. And one is this secretory phenotype or senescence associated secretory phenotype, SAS. This SAS is very, very pro inflammatory and it disrupts the local environment of a cell. Um, and it, it disrupts tissue homeostasis, and it confuses the immune system and causes vulnerability to disease, including COVID 19. Thus, you can think of Senescent cells like a rotten apple that's going to ruin an entire bushel. And clearing senescent cells or rotten apples prevent a whole lot of damage. So that's what we're after with our new class of drugs. So just to conclude here, we at IBM are developing drugs that target senescent cells and the other hallmarks of aging. And just in the four years that we've been in existence, we have developed a very robust drug screening pipeline, a platform for preclinical testing, and we've now started four clinical trials to see if senescent cells work to improve healthy aging and combat the chronic diseases of old age. So we're after healthy aging. Um, just to give credit to those who are in IBAM, um, in addition to myself, we have five other faculty members which are tackling very diverse topics. So we make sure we, we get the, the most out of understanding fundamental aging biology. And if you'd like to uh, learn more about IBM, please contact our direct, director of operations or come visit our website, which are listed here. So thank you very much. As always, Laura, I mean, that was just tremendous. Thank you. Thank you for all your great work. So appreciated. And again, I encourage everyone who's attending today please do use the Q&A box to ask questions of Dr. Niedernhofer or any other of our panelists here uh, this evening. And speaking of panelists, it's now my pleasure to bring in Mary Whipple. Dr. Whipple is an assistant professor in the School of Nursing. Her research focuses on understanding the effects of sedentary behavior and physical activity on cardiovascular health among older adults, with a particular focus on individuals with type 2 diabetes and peripheral artery disease. Dr. Whipple, can you share the causes and consequences of sedentary behavior, as well as ways to promote physical activity? Absolutely. Let me share my screen here. Thank you, Dr. Gogler, for the introduction and for the opportunity to be a part of this uh, wonderful series. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about physical inactivity and sedentary behavior, um, what causes it, and how we can change those behaviors to improve health. I don't have any disclosures, but I want to start by giving a sort of a high level introduction and talk a little bit about what physical activity even is. Uh, we've pro probably all heard that term. We think about physical activity um, often equating it with exercise um, and being active throughout the day. Physical activity, though, is defined as movement that requires the work of the skeletal muscles, and thus it requires more energy. Uh, you might have heard it uh, referred to in terms of light physical activity, things that don't involve a lot of energy, um, but are maybe things like walking around your home, uh, light gardening, also moderate activities that require uh, more intense uh, work and increase your heart rate, and then those vigorous activities um, like running, um, doing high intensity um, sports. 
So the physical activity guidelines for Americans have established some guidelines around what we should be achieving uh, every week. And so those guidelines indicate that we should get at least 150 minutes of this moderate activity every week, um, as well as do some muscle strengthening exercises two days a week. That's particularly important as we age because muscle strengthening activities can help us with balance and flexibility as we age. Um, so another term I wanna introduce here is physical inactivity, which is really just the absence of physical activity, but it's often defined as not meeting these guidelines. And so someone who's uh, referred to as physically inactive might not meet these physical activity guidelines. And this is really important because physical inactivity is really common um, worldwide and in the US. Um, these are data from a nationwide survey um, from 2014, uh, the most recent data that I was able to find uh, by state. And this shows among adults age 50 and older, reports how many adults report, um, report being physically inactive. So this is self-report. Someone asked the question, how much physical activity do you do in a given week? And um, categorize them as physically inactive. You'll see Minnesota is doing a pretty good job. About 20 to 25% of individuals 50 and older are physically inactive. But this region of states in the middle here, more than 35% of those individuals don't achieve physical activity recommendations. And this is critical because worldwide, physical inactivity accounts for lots of negative health effects. One in 10 deaths every year worldwide can be associated with physical inactivity. 6 to 10% of non-communicable disease-related deaths every year, 10% of breast and colon cancers, as well as coronary artery disease and type 2 diabetes. To put this in context, both physical inactivity and smoking are responsible for about 5 million deaths per year worldwide. Yet we know we often think much more about smoking, and we know that that has a negative impact on our health. So. That's physical activity and physical inactivity. One area that I focus on is sedentary behavior. And it's important to know that sedentary behavior is not equal to physical inactivity. They're actually two different behaviors. So sedentary behavior is any waking behavior that uses a small amount of energy and occurs in a sitting or reclining posture. Um, so I have some photos here of just some different examples, it includes sitting while we're commuting, working, screen time, um, all of those types of activities um, can be called sedentary behavior. Sedentary behavior does not include sleep. We know that sleep is important for other aspects of our health. And it's not the same as too little physical activity. So for example, somebody can both be physically active. They can get their 150 minutes of moderate exercise every week, but also be highly sedentary. Uh, if you think about that 150 minutes, that's about the 30 minutes, five days a week. Go out and do your, your walk for 30 minutes, but it matters what you do the other 23 and a half hours of the day. And so this area of sedentary behavior research has really been expanding. And it's important because sedentary behavior is really common. Um, it's, it's uh, and high amounts of sedentary behavior is really common. So using self-report data, again, asking people how much time they spend sitting, about 60% of um, individuals 50 years of age and older will say they sit for about more than four hours a day. Um, a similar amount have more than three hours of screen time per day. But what's interesting is if you look at the numbers using accelerometry. So accelerometry um, usually consists of a, of a small device that has, um, has an accelerometer in it that measures acceleration in different directions, in three different directions. And what it can do is um, tell us how much somebody is moving or not moving. And so this is considered the gold standard way to measure sedentary behavior because sedentary behavior is all around us. And as a population, we're pretty bad at estimating the time you spend sitting. It's the default activity. And so when we use accelerometers in this study of UK older adults, 67% sat for more than eight and a half hours every day. Um, and we know that sedentary behavior tends to increase as we age. And over the last 10 years in the US, the time on average that we spend sitting has increased about an hour per day. So we are becoming more sedentary. The reason that this is important um, outside of physical activity is when we account for how active someone is, when we account for that 150 minutes or whatever amount of physical activity they're getting, every hour, additional hour spent sitting 
increases the risk for mortality by about 6%, the risk of type 2 diabetes, and the risk of obesity. So these studies have measured both physical inactivity or physical activity and sedentary behavior and found that both matter, even among highly active people. So one question might be is, how do we even change this? Um, sedentary behavior is this default activity. It's everywhere. Um, and so that's why it can be really challenging to change. Part of it is a lack of awareness of sedentary behavior and its health consequences. Often we equate it to lack of exercise, and it's really a unique um, health behavior. Some of the barriers include things like health conditions, especially as we age, additional chronic conditions, um, fatigue. Uh, one that's particularly important, I think, is enjoyment of sedentary activities. A lot of the things we do while sedentary, perhaps socializing with friends, family, um, uh, commuting, doing all sorts of activities, um, we enjoy those. And so it's challenging to figure out a way to change that and not remove the activity that's beneficial for other reasons. Um, some motivators to change, though, include a desire to improve health, really just new knowledge about this, understanding what sedentary behavior is and how we can, how we can take action on it, and how we can incorporate it into our current lifestyle. That might mean reminders. It might mean other sorts of strategies to help remind you to, to stand up, to move around um, more frequently throughout the day. We've also found um, through research that we're doing as well as research that's being done across, um, worldwide is that not only matters how much sedentary behavior we accumulate in a day, but kind of the pattern that we're, we're accumulating throughout the day. So prolonged sedentary behavior where we're sitting for a long period of time, two hours, three hours, has negative health effects um, in addition to that total volume. And so we have been studying how to break up or interrupt the sedentary behavior and see um, how that can impact health. There's a, a, a growing body of evidence that says that shows us that if we break up the time we spend sitting, there's improvements in blood pressure, improvements in how our arteries react to stress, improvements in glucose and insulin levels. Um, and you can see here there's a diagram for a study that we're just getting started that looks at comparing um, a block of time where someone is sitting for four hours, a block of time where someone does a 20 minute walk and then sits for the remaining period of time. And then we take that 20 minutes, we break it up. So every hour, someone is doing some walking for five minutes. Um, and studies are showing that this is actually more beneficial, this break method for improving these outcomes. The challenge is, is that we're lacking long term studies. Uh, we don't have a lot of data out in the real world. How do people implement this? And can those effects, same effects, be seen? And a lot of these studies to date have been done in healthy young adults. Um, and so really expanding this into uh, older adults, into people with chronic conditions, uh, my work is expanding it into people with diabetes, I think is really important. Because this might be, breaking up sedentary behavior might be a more approachable strategy to start adding more activity into their daily life. So you might ask, with all of that kind of gloom and doom about the impacts of sedentary behavior and physical activity, what can I do now? Um, so I just encourage you to strive to meet those physical activity guidelines or even exceed them. Um, don't forget about that aerobic exercise, the type that increases your heart rate, makes you sweat, as well as muscle strengthening exercises, balance and flexibility. And then just challenge yourself to spend less of your day sitting. You can be creative. Um, you can set a rem reminder on your phone um, that encourages you to take breaks every hour. Consider walking while talking on the phone, having a walking meeting. Um, you might also consider being less efficient. So thinking about walking back and forth around your house, being a little bit less efficient in tasks to get a little bit more small, uh, light movement throughout the day. Or perhaps think about doing squats or pacing while you're cooking. Um, and the really good news is that all movement counts. The physical activity guidelines used to say that we needed to accumulate our activity in 10 minute bouts or longer. That's not the case anymore. So even a minute or two uh, can be helpful. Um, I want, just want to end by acknowledging um, some seed grant support from the uh, Center for Women's Health Research, both here at the university as well as at the University of Colorado, where I did my postdoc. Um, and I look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Whipple. Again, wonderful presentation. Um, again, I want to encourage all of our attendees today to send questions for our panelists in the Q&A box. I'd also encourage our panelists, Dr. Whipple and Dr. Niedernhofer and later Dr. Schumann, feel free to type in answers to any of the questions that are posed. I think 
you know, if uh, last week is any indicator, we'll have so many, we'll have too many questions to get to. And if you have time and the ability to type answers, uh, that would be wonderful. So now we're going to turn to Dr. Uh, Stephen Schumann. Uh, Dr. Schumann is a professor in the School of Dentistry and the director of the, of the Oral Health Services for Older Adults program. Dr. Schumann's recent research has focused on clinical issues and treatment outcomes for geriatric conditions that complicate treatment planning and care delivery, such as dementia and end-of-life trajectories. Dr. Schumann, can you talk about your dementia-friendly oral health care initiative? Um, yes, I can, Joe, and thanks uh, for, for, uh, for your hosting this, and thanks to all of our attendees on this beautiful day. Uh, it's great to see so many people here. Um, as, as Joe mentioned, one of my long-term interests in oral health and aging has been how to do a better job caring uh, for folks who develop chronic diseases and disabilities as they age, and that's what we focus on teaching here in the dental school as well. Uh, our particular focus is dementia, and this is one of the many articles, headlines that you can see um, telling us what a, what a, a huge uh, challenge uh, we're facing here now. Um, six and a half million older Americans are estimated um, to now uh, be affected uh, by, by Alzheimer's and, and other dementias. That translates in Minnesota here to uh, about 100,000 now with a projection that that will double by 2050 to about 200,000. So we're looking at about 11% of the 65 and over population and up to 30 or more percent of the 85 and over population. Next slide, please. So this has given rise to this type of inquiry, which I now regularly receive. This is an email. I get phone calls and, and other contacts as well. Uh, this was from just uh, last year, about a year ago, from a, a very devoted, concerned daughter who said that she was contacting me uh, because she had found my name when, in looking for some information about dental care for her mother and about the work we were doing uh, at the dental school and at the university on this. Um, so she's concerned that her mother, she says in the first paragraph, is a resident at, at, at a particular assisted uh, living facility on their memory care floor and has advanced Alzheimer's. She says, it came to my attention yesterday that my mom was missing roughly the bottom third to fourth of her right central incisor. This led me to try to find in-house dental care, and so far I'm coming up empty-handed. My mom requires a lift, so she also requires a mechanical lift to move her, and she's no longer able to transport her because of this. I also believe, given her Alzheimer's, it would take specialized care, even if I were able to get her to a clinic office setting. And I'm wondering if you could provide suggestions remarkably. She doesn't seem to be in any pain and doesn't seem to have affected her ability to eat or drink. Again, I, I regularly see these and we also hear the inquiries and questions and concerns coming from the dental practice community as more and more patients uh, with diseases and conditions more common in aging like dementia show up in dental offices. These are folks who have often spent, uh, invested a significant amount of time and effort and money in trying to maintain uh, their, to their oral health and now they've got a problem like this that can really compromise that. Next slide, please. It turns out that uh, this issue of how we prepare uh, communities to take care and do a better job uh, promoting the, the, the health and welfare of folks with dementia is, is a, 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 a very significant initiative that is being conducted here in Minnesota by our area agencies on aging, and they have defined uh, what they call a dementia-friendly community concept. And this is a community that, as you can see here, ensures that people with dementia and their care partners have access to services or treat with dignity and have opportunities to contribute. And some of the elements are, are depicted in that graphic on the right. This means having appropriate housing, having businesses prepared to provide services to folks with dementia and their care partners, um, preparing governmental services such as uh, emergency services, first responders and others, um, 
having faith communities be ready uh, to, and, and able to, to uh, support these folks. And of course, in the upper left there, the healthcare community. Um, so we're not the only folks though. The important thing I think in this graphic is that the, the Dementia Friendly Community Initiative is really designed to help entire communities become better prepared and able to support uh, folks with dementia and their care partners. Uh, I know my, I happen to live in Roseville and our, ours is one of about 60 to 70 communities in Minnesota that have signed on um, to develop their capacity as dementia friendly communities. Next slide, please. So uh, the area agencies on aging, uh, recognizing that in order to really prepare communities that in, in, involves preparing all sorts of uh, businesses and healthcare providers and others approach the Minnesota Dental Association to, to try to get us on board and to get the dental community um, to be uh, to participate in this effort as well. And so um, uh, they asked us to join the effort. We, of course, said, yes, we want to do that. And we were fortunate to find support, not only from the agencies on aging, but also from our Minnesota Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program, uh, a program that, that Joe is also uh, uh, heavily involved in here in our um, uh, Academic Clinical Affairs Center at the university, the School of Dentistry, of course, the Minnesota Dental Association. And importantly, we also received some supplemental funding from the Delta Dental of Minnesota Foundation. Next slide. And so we undertook this project, and the first was to define what a dementia-friendly dental practice would look like, to create a sector guide, which is a more sort of um, um, granular, narrow, kind of specific description of, of what capacities a dementia-friendly uh, dental office uh, should have, um, and then um, to, de to develop a clinical uh, practice tool for dental clinics so that they could um, use that as, a, as a, a ready reference. And then finally, to develop some specific training programs, um, both a basic program for the entire dental team, as well as a more advanced clinical training program for the clinical providers in the dental office. So the dentist uh, assistants, hygienists, dental therapists. Um, so that's what we undertook to do. Next slide, please. And as a result, um, I just want to share with you some of uh, some of our results and, and successes. Uh, this is our website on the Act on Alzheimer's initiative. That's again uh, an effort specifically focused on dementia um, that is uh, managed by the Area Agency on Aging, specifically Trellis, which is the Metropolitan Area Agency on Aging. So you can see uh, we've got a website here that where we have now um, uh, posted all of our tools and information. The web address is there um, if, if you're interested. And of course, we can provide that to you separately as well. Uh, let me show you a little bit about what we've got here. Next slide, please. Um, you can see in the upper left is a description and the information about our dementia friendly at work for healthcare training. This is an hour to an hour and a half basic training program to help enti entire office teams, including the office managers and the finance people and everybody else in the office to understand more about dementia, um, how to communicate better, uh, how folks with dementia may behave, uh, and also to, to know how to recognize and support care partners uh, who may need help as well. So we have that program and a sign up available as well as some descriptive information. On the upper right is the, uh, the description, brief description of our advanced clinical training. This is for the clinical office uh, providers, the dentists, the assistants, the hygienists, the uh, dental therapists who are working in offices directly with patients. Um, and this is now a six hour program. We have six modules of specific information, including things like how to recognize and assess folks with dementia, 
um, how to um, manage them in the dental uh, in during dental procedures more effectively, how to treatment plan appropriately, how to manage ethical and legal issues that might arise, how to manage preventive services, and of course, importantly, recognizing and providing support to to caregivers. So it's it's not only patient support we're interested in, but recognizing and supporting caregivers, care partners who may be under stress, who may be having difficulty and challenges and need to be connected with the appropriate community resources. On the lower left is just the, uh, the, the opening, the, the top page of our dental provider practice tool. This is a seven to eight page document uh, that's also available online uh, for dental providers to go through some basic uh, information and as a basic reference for them in the dental office uh, when if patients uh, or, or care partners need some help or support. And finally, we were fortunate due to the, 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 the funding and support we had to be able to develop some video tutorials. Uh, I really, we really wanted to be able to demonstrate to dental practitioners how to have some potentially difficult conference conversations with their patients. You know, what do you do if you have a patient who looks like they're having memory or thinking changes? How do you decide if a patient is able to provide informed consent uh, and, and assess their decision making? So we were fortunate to be able to film a couple of video tutorials to actually demonstrate those as part of our curriculum. Next slide. And this is uh, actually a sort of a, a historic group for us. This is the first uh, dental practice out in Stillwater that, that, uh, that um, participated in our training. Um, uh, at the South Hill Dental Group since uh, we, we um, put this material out there and uh, we've been working with the Minnesota Dental Association to, to um, promote it and to provide programs for dental uh, practices um, uh, all over the state of Minnesota. Up till now, we have trained about uh, almost 400 people through the basic training and have a train, provided training to about 200 uh, dental practitioners in the advanced clinical program. So that's the, the rundown, Joe. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Dr. Schumann. Thank, thank all of the panelists here this evening. Again, I, I just think an excellent set of presentations. I hope you found them as uh, informative as I did. Now we're going to move on to the questions submitted by you, our attendees. And as a reminder, you can submit your questions to our panelists using the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I'm gonna start with the first question to Dr. Niedernhofer, Laura. Um, how does the concept of One Health fit into geroscience? Well, thank you to the individual who sent that question. I had to educate myself very quickly on One Health, but to me, what that looks like is a really important initiative to understand what about our environment is impacting our health. And that of course will sort of uh, exponentially impact uh, how we uh, how healthy we are in old age over time. Um, and this is thinking about our environment, our nutrition, our ecology, everything, climate. What geroscience is, is really kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. We're saying whatever your lot is in life that got you to the point that makes it look like you're at risk for unhealthy aging, we want to develop an intervention, a pill that will help fix that. And so it, it, it could be a combination of exercise, like Dr. Whipple talked about, in combination with the therapy. We think that'll be incredibly impactful. But I think they're rather distinct entities and, and dovetail nicely to, to address human health. Thank you. Wonderful. This next question is for you, Dr. Whipple. Uh, any role of growth hormone to help with physical activity with aging? Thank you. And I actually just um, added an answer in the uh, in the chat. But I think um, so. We know that uh, increased physical fitness, increased training, can increase growth hormone levels, growth hormone levels, and that those typically get decrease with aging. Um, but as of right now, the evidence seems to suggest that there is no benefit of increasing those growth growth hormone levels to that of um, a younger adult. So that that's what I know so far. <laughs> Great, thank you for that, Mary. And now, of course, I'll turn to Dr. Schumann. 
Um, I think this is a really interesting question, Steve. Will having a dental office, a medical exam office right in a nursing home facility be something that will be uh, in the future for housing for the elderly? You know, I, that, that's a wonderful question and, and observation about where we are uh, in, in terms of our delivery systems for, for dental care. I would like that to be the case. Um, uh, and, and in fact, that's a model that we have uh, employed in our teaching here at the University of Minnesota, where we uh, have had a rotation and a clinical affiliation with, with Walker Methodist in South Minneapolis to bring students and, and dental fellows out on rotations. You know, the challenge is um, working with a system that is especially now under stress in terms of staffing, in terms of finances, um, and, and so un, until we can figure out ways to do this that, that also work financially for the, the long-term care providers and, and the dental providers, um, it seems like we have a big challenge on our hands. Most facilities tend to rely still on portable providers or mobile providers to come in periodically. Unfortunately, they often can't provide the level of comprehensive care that we feel uh, these folks need. But um, I would say that, that but having a facility that has the resources and the, um, and, and the motivation to, to really um, sponsor a comprehensive clinic within the facility is, is a rarity, unfortunately. Um, we are working on a few other initiatives. We believe that facilities should have dental hygienists on staff, just as they have other health professionals on staff uh, to, do, uh, to, to assist with hygiene and triage and communications with uh, community providers. And we've been working on models uh, to implement that as well. But um, unfortunately, some of this uh, rely is dependent on funding. And, and that's a big challenge right now. Great. Thank you, Steve. We'll turn it back to uh, Dr. Niedernhofer here. Um, Laura, do, senes do senescent cells look different across gender, race, socioeconomic, socioeconomic factors, et cetera? Again, a really interesting question. Yeah, absolutely. That is a great question. So yes, our collective wisdom at this point is that senescent cells do increase in all individuals as they age, but there is incredible heterogeneity. So we're also working very carefully to, to develop um, diagnostic studies so that we have ways to measure senescent cell burden in individuals that will make our clinical trials more uh, productive and safer. Um, it looks to me as if women get senescent cells later than men, but then they catch up in spades and that kind of fits with what our knowledge that women tend to have um, delayed onset of age-related diseases, but, but then they accumulate and they spend more time sort of in that red zone than men do. Um, so there are differences in species. So we're also doing comparative studies to try and learn what could prevent senescent if you're a naked mole rat, for example. So a lot of work to do. Thank you. Great, thank you, Laura. So uh, Dr. Whipple, would standing while using our phones, computers, gaming, et cetera, be effective? Would it be a little better than just sitting? It's a great question and actually a really hot area of research right now. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether standing is enough um, and a lot of mixed evidence. Um, what I suspect is that we're going to ultimately find that standing is enough for some outcomes, perhaps like vascular function, blood pressure, but it's not might not be enough for things like glucose and improving, um, improving insulin and uh, blood sugar regulation in the body. So but it's definitely a hot area. If you look at the, the research that's out there right now, people are coming up with pretty much every way you can think of to try to break up sedentary behavior, uh, which is one of the challenges because it's really hard to compare across studies for that reason. Thank you. Uh, let's turn to Dr. Schumann. Uh, what should we consider when trying to gauge if a clinical care setting is age-friendly for our loved ones? Yeah, very, very good question. Yeah, um, boy, uh, you know, and I think uh, Joe might be as, as uh, able to or, or better able to answer this in terms of a general health setting. Um, you know, I think there are some obvious uh, signs, of course, that people know about. I mean, just seeing how 
uh, looking at the attitude and the and the staffing and and how people are are being are communicating and interacting, looking of course at at what the the folks who are um, you know in those settings what what uh, the consumers or patients or others are how they're behaving and how they're functioning and and how they look and and uh, those types of things um, and of course um, you know I think it's nice to uh, find um, care settings where people have had some so some training and some um, some experience in these types of in the management of this type of care. Unfortunately, you know, right now, the workforce issues are just um, a, a huge concern. And I, in fact, I almost don't know of any uh, care setting uh, where the, it isn't a concern. I think it's especially an issue uh, in in the geriatric care sector. Um, you know, nurses and nursing assistants and other therapists who we need um, often now seem to want to work in other settings. And I think this is getting back. And as I say, I'd be interested to leave a minute or two here for Joe to respond to that, um, mm -hmm. because um, I think he has a more global view than probably I do. But the biggest challenge we see even in our own care center. Where, where our clinic is, is the shortage of staffing. You know, the fact that people aren't available um, and don't have enough time to do stuff and the turnover of staff because people can find easier jobs that pay more money. I think we have a real kind of a system workforce crisis going on in the aging community right now. And, and boy, I think unless, uh, I think some of this is again tied to reimbursement. And, and, and paying people uh, what they ought to earn to do this kind of care. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, great answer to what is a real complex question. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen if this works and let's hope it does, okay. And I know Steve is very familiar with this. This has uh, been a central facet of the work we've been doing in the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program or GWEP in Minnesota here. And it's called the 4Ms Framework. And this is basically a framework that's used to advance age-friendly health systems. Um, and I think it's relevant, not just to those of us who study or do research in health systems, but also those of us who are consumers of health systems and hopefully age-friendly ones. And what the 4M stand for is what? What matters? So no one aligned care with each uh, older adult specific goals and care preferences. And you could see uh, key areas are end-of-life care across settings. Then medication. Um, if medication is necessary, use age-friendly medication that doesn't interfere with these other four M's. You know, you could really make a strong argument that good aging care, good geriatric care is really not about prescribing medications, it's about de-prescribing and, and, and taking that viewpoint and approach and understanding that we can't just solve problems by adding medication after medication after medication to a series of acute problems because that in the end is not optimal for an older person or an older body. Third is mentation, which is preventing, identifying, treating, and managing dementia, depression, and delirium across settings of care. And then finally, the fourth M is mobility. Ensure that older adults move safely every day in order to maintain function and do what matters. These are what is considered the four pillars of an age-friendly health system. If the health system that your loved one is using, um, that you're familiar with, isn't doing these things or doing things these things well, these are areas of concern, and you can make a case that, in fact, it's not age-friendly. We'll make sure to share this to every, with everybody. Um, this is a widely shared graphic, and plus, I'll share with you a presentation um, that we had hosted for another center of ours uh, last summer that, again, really gets to this issue of the age-friendly health system. So hopefully you all feel like that helps a little bit. Thanks, Dr. Schumann. So uh, Dr. Niedenhofer, let's go back to you. Um, and I have to jump up. Boy, we got a lot of questions here. So do Dr. Niedenhofer, does alcohol use have a role in aging-related problems? Um, it, it can be a benefit, actually. I'm happy to report if you use it in incredible moderation. So the two facts I know is that um, a modest, modest consumption of alcohol is actually pretty good for your cardiovascular health as long as your liver function is not compromised. The other thing we've learned is that red wine in particular contains a compound that is a geroscience compound. It's called resveratrol. Unfortunately, though, you'd have to drink 
way too much red wine to get enough resveratrol for it to work in the proper way. And the other thing I'm very sad to report is resveratrol is a little bit uh, unstable. And so you have to drink cheap red wine, which is no fun either. So um, moderation, I think, is the key to everything. Thank you for the question. And now let's go to Dr. Whipple, a little bit related to the prior question, Mary. But mm -hmm. although I take breaks throughout the day, I work on a computer all day. Does using a standing desk intermittently during work hours help counteract the effects of being sedentary? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, like I mentioned, we don't quite know whether standing is enough. Um, but what I'll say is another thing is that the breaks don't need to be walking. Um, so it could be things like we've seen some positive results from um, under desk cycling, like those little cycle machines you can get or walking at a desk um, or even some seated calf raises and seated exercises. So there's lots of there's, I think, lots of options and ways to build in breaks. This field has really only developed over the past 15 years or so. If you, you look at the published research, there's been this massive explosion in the last 15 years. And so these are all really great questions that we just haven't gotten to the point of being able to answer yet. We don't know what is the best break method, how frequently we should be doing it, how long we should spend in a break. Um, it's a really uh, an area that we have lots more work to do. Wonderful. Thank you, Mary. So Dr. Schumann, what steps could be taken to increase the prevalence of dentists who rotate through and partner with nursing homes and assisted living facilities. Thanks, Joe. I was just trying to rapidly type the answer to that. And of course, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a great typist. I mean, yeah. I, it was yeah. one of my, one of the courses I took in, in high school where I got a C minus. Um, uh, I think, first of all, um, education is, is we know is necessary. There, there's lots of data out there now, even from the American Dental Association, indicating that dentists want and need uh, more preparation, more training in the care, especially of some of the more complex issues that, that they will run across in, in, in long-term care. You know, they've got to be better and more knowledgeable about geriatric medicine and pharmacology, ethical and legal issues, um, behavioral issues, and how to manage those types of things. So we know that dental professionals really want that. But a big part of the challenge in the dental care system right now, we know that the biggest single barrier to older adults accessing dental care is financing is the lack of coverage and the lack of money it's you know dental care is not covered under medicare right now and that is uh, turning into a huge barrier and unfortunately that limits um, the amount of care sometimes that can be provided and of course that's not a great way to attract dental providers uh, to, to the picture um, fortunately, work is being done. You know, there's, uh, there have been a few different bills that have been introduced um, to expand uh, Medicare coverage to include dental care. Um, and in fact, we made some important headway this past year um, with um, the recognition by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that in fact, um, medically necessary dental care should be and can be included. And so we're beginning to see the doors open. I think for Medicare dental coverage. And I think that will be an important asset in terms of um, making it more possible for people to want and get the care they need. And then uh, in, in making sure that it's uh, realistic for dentists to provide it. Great, thank you, Steve. And I think we're gonna close with a little lightning round question here, You know, starting with Laura, then Mary and Steve. I'd like you to provide what is your one key takeaway on creating pathways to healthy aging that people can do right now? So, so Dr. Niedernhofer. Well, I have to wholly endorse Dr. Whipple's talk right now, exercise, reducing stress, getting, having good sleep habits, moderation in what you're eating. Um, and, and the other thing I would say is there is very good evidence in every preclinical model that we've ever used to biomedicine that compressed eating has a big impact. We haven't tested this yet in humans, but what it means is if you can consume all your calories and that could be anything you want to eat, but healthy food, okay, nutritious food, eat it in the smallest window of time you possibly can um, in a 24 hour period. That's compressed eating and it really helps control um, 
insulin levels, which is really healthy for you. So we're anticipating this will work in humans. Um, and if you're willing to try, it beats fasting. I'll tell you that. Great. Uh, Dr. Whipple, what would you think? I, I would second all those recommendations. Um, I think the, the mantra that I um, often use is sit less, move more. That's pretty common. Um, and I think um, reduce, yeah, the reducing stress, finding ways to um, to stay active, and including, I think, strength training is something that we often lose as we get, we lose muscle mass as we get older. And finding opportunities to build in strength uh, training, flexibility training can really help people age well. Wonderful. Thank you, Mary. And uh, Dr. Schumann, what about you? Uh, I am going to um, second or third uh, the comments that have already been made. What, the, what I tell folks is do what your mother told you. Um, you know, <laughs> take care of yourself, active. I also, and of course, we, I don't think we touched on it, but there's uh, lots of information out about the blue zones and areas of the world that uh, have longer lived populations. And, and I think you heard from our previous presenters some of the habits that are found there. I would simply add to what they said, the need uh, and the importance of, of remembering that your oral health is yes. part of your overall health. And that, um, you know, we had a Surgeon General some years ago who said you can't be healthy without good oral health. And we think that's true. We're seeing more and more research evidence of that. Um, and whether it's directly through oral health issues themselves or through oral health problems contributing to inflammation in the body, we think that that uh, shouldn't be forgotten when you're looking after your health. Yeah, I'll share with everyone. I'm sure you're familiar with this, Steve. Uh, actually, an article came on the New York Times less than a week ago how oral health is key to your overall health. And I thought it was very interesting. And certainly right. this has great correlation with aging and aging healthy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, in terms of that question for me, I, I think, and again, it's very similar to what you've heard is I think thinking about this from maybe four different dimensions, all related. Um, one is uh, diet. I mean, really it seems, again, no one can say this for sure, Mediterranean diet. Um, and trying to adhere to that as much as possible. Yes, if we can restrict our calories, that's great. We all know how hard that is. But at the same time, I mean, if there is a diet pathway to brain health and overall health, that might be one of them. It may also contribute to this idea of the blue zones too, to some extent. I think second is, of course, a moderate exercise with a focus, not just on cardiovascular exercise, but then also strength training and, and stretching and flexibility. The latter two are very helpful to prevent adverse events like falls in life that can be really catastrophic in many different ways. Um, third, I would argue is social engagement, which we kind of touched on a little bit today, but we know social isolation and particularly loneliness is linked to a range of adverse outcomes, including expedited mortality. I mean, I think that's something else that we should be paying attention to um, as we age throughout the life course. And I think if we do all those th three things effectively, then that, that, that then leads to better management of stress. Um, certainly one thing we can do actively is manage cardiovascular disease risk factors, doing all of these different things. That certainly is important because again, cardiovascular health certainly is a gateway. We know to brain health, but also to a number of other adverse health conditions as well. So I think with that, we will conclude today. Uh, just a real pleasure to have our three wonderful panelists here today. We so appreciate them sharing uh, their time and insights with us and how we can all uh, age more healthily. Of course, we wanna thank you, our participants in the Mini Medical School for joining us today and, and sharing what really were thought provoking questions. We hope to see you next week for the third Mini Medical School session on mental health and well being, which is gonna be the same time as today, but and held next Wednesday. We have an amazing group of experts that will discuss nutrition and aging, resources for medication management, and improving quality of life. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Enjoy the very warm weather, and we hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Take care.